Let's go to Lord in prayer as we turn to the text today. Father, we just come before you needy, as we always do. We never come bringing to you anything that you haven't already given us. Help us see the text. Help us delight in Jesus. And God, I just pray that you would use this text today to to just reset our vision of true greatness. We reset our vision of what, what should drive our humility and our humble service. God, let us be Jesus to the people around us. In your son's precious name we pray. Amen. You know, as we, we turn to the text this morning, you might kind of be wondering, haven't we heard this already? I, I mean, doesn't it sound kind of familiar, this conversation that the disciples and Jesus are having? I, I mean, and the answer is both yes and no. I mean, I mean we've, we've heard it in chapter 8. We've heard it in chapter 31. And, and this cycle that we're in, which is the third of three cycles, we see the same thing happen. Jesus predicts his death. The disciples reveal their remaining spiritual blindness. They they see, but they don't see. And then Jesus comes around at the end and responds to their their condition by teaching them about the nature of true greatness. So, So these three things have happened in each text. It looks different each time, and it'll look different today. So on one hand, yes, Jesus has been doing the same thing in these three episodes over and over again, and we see his disciples who are just like our kids with with everything going in one ear and out the other. Doesn't matter how many times I tell them, right? In one ear, out the other. But at the same time, there's new. It's not just what he said before. Jesus is revealing new things. In fact, he's going to reveal the fundamental reason why sacrificial service is the only means to greatness in the kingdom of God. He's going to reveal that in our text today. And the reason is this. Sacrificial service is is really the path to true greatness in the kingdom of God because Jesus served us first. The reason it is the path to greatness is because it is a reflection of what Jesus himself has done. We're going to see that unpacked as we go into the text. So we're going to break this this section down into its three pieces, just like the other two episodes we've been in. First piece is, is we're going to give the Messiah, Jesus Christ is going to give a prediction about what's coming up verses 32 to 34. Then we're going to see the disciples' blindness in 35 through 41, and Jesus is going to come around at the end and show them the only path to true greatness in verses 42 through 45. So let's go to 32 through 34 and look at this prediction. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem. Jesus was walking ahead of them, and they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the 12 again, he began to tell them, what was to happen to him, saying, see, see, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him, and after three days he will rise. Now, now, now before we get to the prediction, I want to point out something that we could easily read over if we're reading too quickly. Because he actually presents us with with a new development and a puzzling question. The new development in the text is the destination. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus has been all over Galilee, all over the northern reaches of Israel. He's been even outside into Gentile country. He's been up to Tyre and Sidon. But in the Gospel of Mark, where has he not been? He hasn't been to Jerusalem. He hasn't been there at all. I mean, it's the very, very center of Israel's spirituality. 
It's also home to his most adamant opponents. Have you noticed most of the time when the scribes and the Pharisees show up on the scene, where are they coming from? They're they're coming out of Jerusalem. They're they're hunting down Jesus, and they're, they're going into conflict with Jesus. So in this simple geographic reference, Mark is telling us that Jesus, the Messiah, is making his final turn. I mean, we're we're moving to the climax of the book. He's making the final turn. He's going to the capital. He's going to the cross. That's where Jesus is is now going. From, From these verses on forward, it's straight to the cross. At the same time as Jesus is going to this is going to Jerusalem. This, 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 this travel party seems a little confusing. It's like, it's like, why are people afraid? I mean, why, why are these fearful people around Jesus Christ? Because it's clear it's more than the 12 because he's with a group of people and he isolates the 12 from the people. The best answer seems to be that Jesus even though Mark hasn't always been, been, been demonstrating it to us in the text, Jesus is still gathering a large following of people. He's gathering a large following. They've seen His miracles. They've heard His teaching. So many of them believe that He might be the promised Messiah. And if they believe that He's the promised Messiah, it can only mean one thing. In their expectations of the Messiah, what happens when the Messiah rolls onto the scene in Jerusalem? It means that the Messiah is going to claim the throne, He's going to purify the priesthood, and He is going to lay waste to the Roman occupiers. That's their mindset of what's going to happen when the Messiah arrives on the scene. They have visions of the streets filled with blood. They're afraid. They're excited, they're anticipatory, but they're afraid because all of their expectations of what the Messiah will do when He arrives. In in fact, this anticipation helps us understand the question that, that James and John ask of Jesus Christ. See, if everybody is thinking, kingdom's coming, Jesus is gonna go claim the throne. We got two guys in the group of disciples who are going, Dude, we only got a couple more days till we're in town. We, we, we'd better get ourselves a good seat in the house. Because they're expecting Jesus to rule and they want to be in the right spot when it happens. But here's the deal. We know. I mean, we know Jesus isn't going to Jerusalem to claim the throne. He's not. He's not going to install new priests in the temple. He's not just going to prop up a broken down system. And he's and he's and he's not going to annihilate the Roman army. Jesus is going to Jerusalem so that he can be rejected, tortured, executed and gloriously by the power of God raised to life. That's why Jesus is going. That's that's what he wants his disciples to understand, but they're not getting it. In fact, before we dig into our prediction today, I want to stack up all, all three predictions so you can kind of see what Jesus has been doing. Because each time he kind of adds something to the revelation of what's coming down the road. So if we go back to Mark chapter 8, verse 31, we see Jesus, this is right after Peter realizes, or Peter understands that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. See, in in, in this first account, Jesus is highlighting his imminent suffering and his rejection, two things which the disciples are not expecting, which nobody is expecting of the Messiah, rejection and suffering. 
In fact, it's going to happen at the hands, the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, which means that, that Jesus is not going to finally win over the religious establishment. He's telling them, I'm not, these guys aren't going to be won over. They are dead set against me. They're going to be fighting against me nonstop. And in the end, they are going to be my end. We go to the second text, Mark chapter 9, verse 31. For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. Notice, notice, he's going to be killed, and he's going to be raised again from the dead. Constant teaching. But what, what, what's the change here? The focus isn't on the scribes and the priests. It's on the fact that, that God himself is going to deliver Jesus. When it says that Jesus is going to be delivered into the hands of men, who can deliver him into the hands of men but God himself? This is known as a, as a divine passive. In other words, his imminent death is not going to be a tragic accident. It's, it's not going to be a successful coup, and his resurrection from the dead is not a convenient but divine adjustment. It's the plan of God. Let me get to our text today, Mark 10. See, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered. Okay, we have the delivering language. Oh, to the chief priests and the scribes. All right, we already have those guys from, from our first two. What happens next? And they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him, and after three days he will rise. Now, notice what Jesus has brought into this final picture. In this third prediction, Israel's leaders, the very ones the very ones who proclaim God's holy word, the very ones who are longing for God's promised Messiah are going to be the very ones who hand, not, just, not just kill the Messiah, but the ones who are going to hand over the Messiah to their sworn enemies, the Romans. Don't let that go by you. They hate the Gentiles. They hate the Romans. But that's the very people that they're going to give Jesus to. And Jesus is going to be mocked, and he's going to be spit upon, and he's going to be flogged, and he's going to be executed. I mean, I mean just, just look at this. What does this mean? It means that Israel's spiritual leaders would rather preserve their positions of power under Roman occupation than to embrace God's promised Messiah. That, that's what's going on in the text. And, and that's despite the fact that Jesus has given them every reason to believe. In His teaching, in His miracles, they have every reason to believe. And on account of this, his betrayal is nothing less than a malicious, premeditated act of cosmic treason. It's treason. It's an act of cosmic treason against Israel's covenant God and the very creator of the universe himself. That's what's coming. I, I mean, the disciples should just be riveted. They should be crushed. They should be just pulling, what do you mean? What do you mean that these guys are going to do that? But that's not their response. I mean, 
they should be asking questions. But the sad irony is, is, that, is that as Jesus draws closer and closer to his final days, his disciples are not drawing any closer to their understanding of his mission. They might grasp that he's the Messiah, but they're not getting the messianic mission piece. Jesus has been talking about death and resurrection for three chapters. Three three chapters. And for three chapters, the disciples have been blind. For three chapters, they've been afraid to simply ask to understand what they need to understand. And when they finally, they, they finally ask a question, it's two of them that step forward and they betray their persistent short sightedness. And that that they want want to be quick to claim the privileges of their association with Jesus while they completely ignore the cost of participating in it. Verse 35, And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, teacher, we, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Carte blanche. Empty check. Will you just do it, Jesus? And Jesus says to them, what, what do you want? What do you want? And they said to him, well, grant us, grant us to sit one on your right hand and one on your left in your glory. And Jesus said to them, you don't, you don't know what you're asking. Are, are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that, with which I'm baptized? And they said to him, oh, yeah, 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 we're able And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink and will drink, and you will drink, and the the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it's for those for whom it's been prepared. And when the ten heard of it, they began to be indignant with James and John. Do you see what they're asking for? They're not humbly asking to understand so that they can see. We've had this conversation ever since, ever since the conversation on the parables began. All of, all of Jesus' teaching calling for more questions so he'll provide more answers. And they're not asking. They're, they're, they're arrogantly asking to be seen instead of to understand. They, they want to sit in places of honor and power at his right hand. Right after he says, I'm getting flogged and I'm going to be murdered. See, they misunderstand what it means for Jesus to be Messiah. And they assume that they deserve special privileges because they're his friends. That's what's going on. Hey, we've been following you. We've done lots of stuff. Time for a little payback. Yet in their question, what are they betraying about their expectation of the messianic kingdom? They're they're betraying their, their, their idea that it's really nothing different than the day that we live in now. In, in, the, in that nepotism and, and cronyism and, and pork barrel politics are going to rule the day in the messianic kingdom just like they do in our day and age. That's, that, that's what, that's what they're, they're betraying. Even more, their question real, re- reveals they're not really considering anybody but themselves. I mean, I mean they, they, what are they wanting to do? They, they, they're looking to replace the self-serving governmental, of, uh, go- governmental structure of Rome with their own self-serving structure. Well, and we'll just be better than Romans. I mean, mean, it's a situation in which nothing changes except the names of the rulers. I mean, that's what they're acting like here. And what are they missing? Jesus has spent three different times now to help them, to try to get them to understand glory follows suffering. Glory, glory follows suffering. It's not that there's no glory. 
is that suffering is always before glory. Glory is always last, and Jesus is lowering himself to the very last. That's what Jesus is doing. He's lowering himself to the very last, and as a result of this, he will, he will receive the highest and greatest place of all. We could go to Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11 and see that. But let's go to the Savior's rebuttal. I think that we need to take and just praise Jesus for how he responds to his ignorant disciples because it gives us comfort in our ignorance. James and John here deserve, they deserve a tongue lashing. They deserve a reprimand. I, I mean, they, they can't even fathom what they're asking for, or the events that they say that they can, they can, they can endure. Yeah, Jesus, we can, we can do that cup and baptism thing, whatever that is. But Jesus is patient and kind. I mean, when Jesus says, you can't, you can't take my cup and you can't take my baptism. Let me, let me just pause on those just for a second. We could spend a whole lot more time on them, but, but this word cup throughout our Bible is most normally used. It's, it's used two different ways. One's positively, but mostly it's used in terms of wrath and judgment. He's taking the cup of the wrath of God, and he's drinking it. That, that's, that's the picture that we're getting here. Can you take that cup? Can, can, can you take that cup of wrath? You say, no, you can't. Can, can, you, can you be baptized in the baptism that I'm going to be baptized in? And now, a lot of people, when they think about baptism, their first picture is, well, it's, it's a picture of washing away things and, and cleansing, but baptism is a picture of judgment. It's a picture of God's white, hot wrath against sin. That's, that's baptism. What, what happened in Genesis God wiped out virtually the entire human race in a baptism, saving only those on the ark. And he is going to drown Jesus in the white hot fury of his anger, not against Jesus, but against our sins. Jesus is standing to absorb the wrath of God. That's his baptism. He's going to die. That's what he has coming. But notice he says, he says, you are going to have a cup and you are going to have a baptism, but, but it's categorically different from mine. I mean, I mean, look at the lives of the apostles, and, and we can look at their martyrdom. They are going to suffer for the sake of Jesus. Some of them aren't going to make it very long after the death of Jesus Christ, and they're going to be put to death as well. Others are going to last much longer. But see... The difference, and Jesus is going to talk about this more at the end of the passage, is that this, this, this event that he is going through is going to be the singular event that rescues countless men and women from the very wrath of God. Jesus isn't merely dying to be an example. We are to look at the example, but it's more. What's, what's going on here? Okay, we're, we're going to, two texts, we're not going to unpack them, but they're good for us to interact with right now. What is going on at the cross? Second Thessalonians that we're getting saved from. Second Thessalonians 1, 6 through 10. Paul says this, since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you 
and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his might when he comes on the day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all whom believe because our testimony to you was believed. That's the cup and the baptism. That's what, that's the wrath that's being poured out against sinful men who have not received the gospel. Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. And I saw a great white throne, and on him who was seated on it, and from his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. Then I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened, and then another book was opened, which, in the, which is the book of life. The dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what had been done. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them according to what they'd done. And then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if any name, anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. This is why Jesus came. Not merely to be a teacher, not merely to provide us with a nice way to live or an example of what humility looks like. Yes, he did all of those, but the reason he came was to deliver us from the wrath of God. But notice as the other ten disciples walk back into the picture, <laughs> they're, not, they're not frustrated with James and John because they're clueless about the cross. <laughs> they're, they're angry because, because they're fighting over the best seats in the kingdom too. James and John are merely revealing what's going on in the hearts of all 12 disciples. Verses 42 and 45. And Jesus called them to him and said, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their, their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and who would ever be first among you must be slave of all. For... Even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The reason he came. Why are they still so blind? Why are they still so blind? Why do we know they're still so blind? It's because, it's because they're still not measuring greatness by the kingdom. They're measuring it by the pattern of this world. And if you just think about it, I mean, what are the, what are the key marks of, of worldly rulers? What, what, what are the key marks of worldly authority? Where worldly rulers, for the most part, stand above others and exercise authority over their subjects. It's all about top down. It's all about having control, telling people what to do, and not having others controlling you. Right? And the disciples are thinking, how can I distinguish myself from these other clowns so that I can make it big in the kingdom? But notice how Jesus resets their pursuit of greatness. He resets it. And it's a, it's a reset that, that most of us need, and, and frankly, that as a Christian, I, I, I think that we need this reset countless times in our Christian lives, because we drift, but we need this reset. 
as my former pastor Jason Meyer points out, notice, Jesus doesn't tell them, hey, hey, stop, stop trying to be great. He doesn't tell them to stop trying to be great. He doesn't rebuke them for their quest of greatness. No, he redefines the quest by redefining greatness. Because true greatness is not elevating oneself, elevating yourself over others as Lord, but getting beneath others as a servant. He continues to say, first place is not the highest place of privilege. It's the lowest place of a servant. Therefore, it's not about how high you can climb as you step on and over as many people as possible, but how long you can go as you seek to serve as many people as possible. That's that's true greatness, according to Jesus. See, the, the preeminent virtue of God's kingdom, it's not power, and it's not personal freedom. It's service. It's humble, others-centered, selfless service. In other words, true greatness belongs to the people who are not inherently great in the world's eyes. It's the one, it's the one who takes the position of being a slave. And it's the position that every one of us are normally trying to avoid. We we want to avoid the position of service. And Jesus is saying, look, the kingdom turns the world's values upside down. Don't, Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised the kingdom turns everything upside down. Jesus is the king that came to give, not to get. And as his people, he calls us to to be people who, who give our lives to giving, not to be getting. Verse 45, for even the Son of Man came not to serve, but to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Notice as he calls his disciples and he calls us by extension to be servants. He's he's not telling us that that, that servanthood is, is, is preferable to being served. He's not saying it's preferable to being served, and he's not saying that it's just simply ethically better. It's not simply that. He's, he's, he's saying that it's, it reflects the very posture that he has as Messiah, as the Son of Man. It's his very posture. It's his nature. It, it defines who he is. It's not merely preferable. It is, it's something that absolutely defines his very existence, and his purpose. And when Jesus calls, him the son of, calls himself the son of man, Je- Jesus isn't saying, hey, I- I- I'm human too. I-, I know some of you know this and some of you don't, and that's why I want to raise this up. When Jesus calls himself the son of man, he, he, he is, he is, he's actually saying, I'm the promised ruler of the world. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days, God the Father, and he was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. You know who we're talking about? His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. That's the Son of Man. 
That, that's, that's the picture that they have of the, the Messiah, this, this, this person who's going to reign and rule, but they didn't, have the, they didn't have the category for his suffering. Jesus is the ruler who is going to rule over all rulers. No one is greater. No one, no one is equal. And that's because no one has gone lower than Jesus went. No one has. No, because what did he do? He purchased our deliverance through his death by giving his life as a ransom for many. No one's gone lower. Jesus, God Almighty, who did not count equality with God a thing to be held on to in such a way that he would not purchase our salvation. But he humbled himself. He became a servant and he took on the likeness of man. Became a slave, what? To the point of death on the cross. And why did Jesus do that? Were we, were we these great people that just needed a little help over the hump of, of morality? No, we were lost. We were rebels. We are destined for hell. And rightly so because of our sin and rebellion. See, the, the, the gospel reminds us we don't deserve anything but eternal punishment. And then when Jesus talks about service and being the lowest, there isn't a thing that you and I could do in service of other people that would be to go lower than Jesus went to purchase us. Just just let that settle for a minute. Because I think we have, we have a lot of inbuilt notions that there needs to be some sort of requirement meant before I'm going to serve somebody else. That I'm actually going to reach in and, and help them out. Sometimes we want payback. Other times we just, we just want them to be people that like us. But, but, but here, Jesus' example is based on the fact that, that, that we had nothing deserving of his love, nothing deserving of his servants. How often do we think that people that, of somebody who might need some help, and we instantly discount it because of a broken relationship we have? Something they've done in the recent, or maybe something they did 15 years ago, and we refuse we refuse to get underneath and to lift them up at a time when they need it. Jesus is saying, you can't go lower than I already went. The lowest you could possibly go is still not as low as Jesus went. And he gave his life as a ransom for many. That's the purpose of his going low. Again, not just a good example to be follow. Liberalism would say Jesus is just a good example to follow. No. No, not alone. No, he came to purchase. He came to give his life as a ransom for many. His greatness is defined by this. And that he gave his life for wretched rebels who rightfully deserve punishment. but instead they receive everlasting joy when they come to faith in Him. That's His greatness. So when you you hear the word ransom, what comes to mind? Like like kidnappers, right? Ransom, we got kidnappers, they stole somebody. Or or maybe terrorists have a ransom. In in Jesus' day, ransom was, was a little more directed towards, in their culture, towards prisoners of war and slaves. They, they were ransomed, a price paid to, to, get, to get war prisoners back, a price paid to free a slave from their slavery. But the kind of ransom that, that, that is going on here is actually more connected to Old Testament ideas of ransom. And it's linked to the sacrificial system. 
in, in which guilty humans needed a substitute. We, we needed a substitute to, to take away their guilt before God, and God provided a way to cover their sin and escape his wrath through the death of a substitute, which is normally a lamb, sometimes a goat. That's why it's called substitutionary sacrifice. And here's the beautiful thing that we see in this text is that Jesus uses this substitutionary language in reference to himself. He's giving his life as a ransom for many. He's giving his life as a ransom in exchange for many. He's giving his life in the place of many. His selfless sacrifice is not merely about helping people with their daily needs, but addressing their greatest need. Peace with God. And in Jesus, in his example, what do we see? We see that the highest person, God himself, we see that the highest person, the, the, the great king of Daniel chapter seven, the son of man, took the lowest place to serve a hellbound race. And in the cross, he took our place, he paid our debt, and he satisfied God's wrath. The ransom, the ransom for many. So as we close out, let's get to the question why. Why would any human pursue a life of self-abasing service to other people? Because I think we can kind of have a category for Jesus doing it and, and somehow escape its application to us. Because servanthood isn't comfortable, is it? So servanthood isn't desirable. Servanthood isn't manageable. And, and, and servanthood can be demeaning and frustrating and virtually unending. I mean, you start serving people's needs and you're going to start finding out people have all sorts of needs. But even more as a servant, you never really get to set yourself apart from other people. Because as you're serving everybody else, they're moving up and they're moving on. And you, and, you, and you keep lifting up and serving. And can feel like, I'm really not making any headway in life because I'm just serving. Yet according to Jesus, this is the very definition of being first and not last. This life is a vapor. It's a vapor. It's short. We can't forget that. It won't last. You see, Jesus doesn't tell his disciples here just to look at their service. And he, doesn't, and he doesn't thankfully tell us to look at other people to motivate us to service because, frankly, if you start looking at the people you're serving, sometimes you, can, you have every reason to not want to help. People can be frustrating, right? He says, no. No. He says, remember. Remember, you can never, ever, ever Stoop lower or sacrifice more than what I've already done for you. That's what Jesus is saying. You can never, you can never do more than what's already been done. True greatness has nothing to do with your earthly status. It has to do everything with a relentless pursuit of helping other people find their greatest joy and their greatest happiness in God himself through faith in Jesus Christ. That's, that's true greatness. And, and as we do that, what are we doing? We're using every means in our disposal 
to, to lessen sorrow, to deepen relationships and increase joy. That's, that's the focus of our service. Into other people as we trust in God and never forget what he's done for us. Let's close in order of prayer. Oh, Father, I just, I just pray that you would fill us, God, with the knowledge of your will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. God, that we might walk and serve in a manner that's worthy of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, that we'd be a people that's bearing fruit in, in every good work, God, as we eagerly serve one another for your glory. And God, in all this, in all this, that you would strengthen us with all your power according to your glorious, glorious might. God, that we might patiently endure through all things with patience, giving thanks to you because you have qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints. And may we never forget that you've delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son you loved through his death, burial, and resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.